If you have your Bibles this evening, we want to conclude this four-part series in our Call to Fall series. And we started this sermon last Sunday night called Prayer That Will Rock the Church. Now we have begun a series in the book of Acts and we've, and we've jumped forward a little bit from where we were uh, there in chapter 2. But our key verses, if you will, look at uh, chapter 4, verses 31 through 33. 31 through 33. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power, uh, and with great power gave apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And uh, the power, prayer that will rock the church. If the church uh, today is going to make any difference for God, in the 21st century we have got to go back to learn from the church of the first century. And there's no better book in the entire Word of God to do that than the, than the book of Acts. This is the model. Uh, this is the pattern. And uh, Peter, in chapter 2, preached the great sermon of Pentecost. And 3,000 were saved in one day. Well, by the time you get to chapter 4, 120 grew to 20,000 in a matter of weeks. So wouldn't it be wonderful if our churches today uh, could do that? What, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could experience that kind of victory? Well, it will take very powerful prayer. I don't mean just, uh, just uh, simplistic prayer. It will take God's people like... Uh, 40,000 were given the challenge to bow the knee uh, uh, to uh, God this morning. Peter and John there, we know, uh, were arrested there in, in the temple there healing the lame man. And they were told not to go back uh, to witnessing. But they said, we cannot uh, stop speaking about the things that we have seen and hurt. Now we consider first of all the perspective of prayer. If you want to pray with power, if you want God to make his presence known, if you want him to rock the church house, you must pray with the proper perspective. Now notice if you will, let's go back uh, 24 through uh, uh, 28. And when they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kinds of the earth swoon up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against this, his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever they, uh, thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. They had a perspective of God as sovereign. They saw him as almighty uh, creator. They said they had the proper perspective. Uh, they had secondly uh, they, uh, the absolute sovereignty of God. Not only did they see God as the almighty creator, but as the absolute, absolute sovereign Lord. And here uh, they're taking, uh, going back to uh, 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 the Psalms. 
You know, Corey Tim Boo, she suffered through Hitler's concentration camps, lost uh, several of her family members. And yet there was a shining testimony for Jesus Christ, and she once said, there is no panic in heaven, only plans. Uh, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, used to say, the Holy Trinity never meets in emergency session. Then they had a perspective of themselves. There the word servant, I believe in the Greek it's doulos. Uh, you know, God doesn't want to be our partner. God doesn't want to be our co-pilot. Have you ever seen the bumper stickers, God is my co-pilot? Nope. Not your co-pilot. You better be your pilot. If he's your co-pilot, you are in trouble. He is our L-O-R-D, our Lord. Now we go tonight into the purpose of this prayer. I not only want us to see the perspective of the prayer, but the purpose of the prayer. And if we pray with the wrong purpose, uh, then uh, it will not, they will not have any power. First of all, if you'll notice in verse 29, they speak God's word. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They pray that God will enable them to speak his word. Is this the desire of our hearts? this evening. We may not all be preachers. We may not all be teachers. But it is our desire to speak, to proclaim the Word of God. Lord, give us the boldness to speak your Word. If we want to see real change, little Switzerland, North Carolina, Spruce Pine, North Carolina, real change in America, we need to be winsome witnesses to the grace of of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Oh, why did they? Why did the apostles always get in trouble in the Book of Acts? They all the time got into trouble. Well, the reason that they did because they was preaching the Word of God, and the uh, officials told them, "says You can't do this. This is against the law. You've got to shut your mouth." Uh, well, uh, they couldn't. They had to go on. We want to speak your word. They had such a burning desire in their heart. Now Jesus Christ, you know, uh, he, uh, he didn't come to get us out of trouble. He came to get into trouble with you. He said himself, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. Paul, everywhere he went, there was either a riot or a revival. They were continually trying to run him and the other apostles out of town. Lord, give us boldness. And I admire that so much. I love them. They had the boldness. And I'm afraid we are lacking that today. They not only prayed that God would enable them to speak his word, but to stretch out his hand there in verse 30 by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child, uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus is in heaven, but yet they're praying, Lord, stretch out your hand. What hand did he have? He had their hands. They were saying, Lord, not only do we want our mouth to be your mouth, but let our hand be your hand. Uh, Acts 5, 12 answers there that question. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. We are the hands of God. We are the instruments of God to see. Does God have to use us to get his will done? Absolutely not. He could use any means that he desires. 
but he chooses to use human beings. He chooses to use uh, his children to get his will done. There was a cathedral in Europe that was bombed during World War II. And in that cathedral, there used to stand a magnificent statue of Jesus Christ with his arms outstretched and the inscription read, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, there were some Americans who wanted to rebuild the cathedral and reconstruct that statue. They searched through the rubble, found the parts, proceeded to reassemble the statue. But when they <coughs> came to hands, they couldn't find any <coughs> intact. They had been destroyed. But somebody had an idea, and he wrote another inscription beneath that statue with those arms without hands stretched out. He has no hands, our hands, in the self-limitation of God in Jesus Christ in getting the gospel out. We are his hands, we are his feet. Thirdly, they synchronize with God's will. Notice, if you will, verse 30 again. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child of Jesus Christ. What does this mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Does this mean to get our shopping list and after we be ready to say in the name of Jesus, amen? Well, yeah, we... We tend to do this, and there's nothing wrong with taking God, uh, taking to God our needs. But you know, if the church is ever going to have any power, it's got to go beyond that. It's got to go way beyond that and pray with power and conviction. Now, you know, uh, that we often think that there's a magical formula that will get our prayers answered. No, God is not some glorified grandpa indulging us and doting on us. Uh, God is the almighty creator and the, and the sovereign Lord. And as his servants, we need to get his mind on the mouth. Praying with the mind of Jesus. The kind of prayer that rocks the church. Lord, I want to speak your word. I want to stretch out your hand. Lord, I want to sink with your will. If we could pray all three of those things and desire them in our heart, then I believe that we're going to be in tune with God. Now, thirdly, if you notice, we see the power of this prayer. We've talked about the perspective of their prayer, and out of that perspective, they prayed with a purpose. Now, here is the third thing. The power of this prayer, or better yet, the power of God's answer to this prayer. Now, as we have read in verses 31 through 33, first of all, they were filled. What were they filled with? They were filled with the Spirit. Now we get all the Spirit of God we're going to get when we get saved. But a lot of times we quench the Spirit and we continually have to pray for, I guess, a renewal. But, uh, you know, uh, we are to pray, God give me a craving to sing with your solemn will. They prayed uh, this purpose. They were filled there. Going back to Acts 2, they were the apostles there, the disciples, were filled with the Spirit there on the day of Pentecost. And Peter preaching there the mighty message. 3,000 were saved. You know, a lot of times we go on past experiences. We go on 
the great things, the great spiritual things that happened in the church years ago. We can't do that. We've got to continually having a fresh filling, having a fresh renewal of the Spirit. We need power for today. We can't rely on what happened three years ago or three months or three weeks ago. Are we filled tonight with the Spirit? They were unified there. Uh, we see in verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. They became one in heart, one in soul. They were unified. Psalms 133, 1, How good and perfect it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is like the oil poured on Aaron's head and the dew on Mount Hur. Unity is a beautiful thing. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another in John 13, 35. Love produces unity, not uniformity, not sameness. We're not going to agree on uh, all uh, most things theological, but on the main things, on the efficacy of Jesus Christ. And on the night before his death, the Lord Jesus prayed to the Father that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me. You know, there was incredible unity in the first century church there in Acts. And the tragedy was. If you, if you know your church history and all the schisms and, and the battles and, and the things that happened there through the centuries, this unity suddenly, well, it was wounded, I guess you could say. But that fresh unity, that innocence there they had in the early church. And you know, prayer... Uh, helps produce that. Uh, when they prayed, there was a unity. And then they were in both. They were filled with the Spirit. They were unified. And then it says they preached Jesus with boldness. You know, God's Spirit just doesn't fill you just so you feel good. And you feel pretty good with the Spirit of God in you. But He fills you so that you can bear witness to Jesus and He gives us power for a purpose. One of the, the theme verse of the book of Acts, ye shall, be my, ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and ye shall be my witnesses. But we surrender tonight to that purpose. The early church prayed for boldness to witness, and the Bible says that when the Spirit filled them, that with that great power they continued to bear witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer and power do go together. With great power they continued to bear witness. A witness is someone who has an encounter with the living. Now you look at these uh, disciples. And they indeed had an encounter with the living Lord. They sat at His feet for three and a half years. They learned. They heard His teaching. They saw His miracles and His healing. And they saw that He was just not another man. Never a man spake like this man. And they saw the living Lord there. Their master, they saw him die upon Calvary's cross. And they thought that all hope was lost. And then they saw him resurrected the third day. Now they didn't, they didn't realize that he was actually going to be resurrected even though he told them. Oh, 
over and over and over that he would be resurrected. You know, when we witness for Christ, often we say, well, I can't witness. I'm shy. You know, if we allow the Spirit of God to rule and to reign in our lives, then you'll have to hold you back with a rope turning the world upside down. And that's what the early church was accused of doing, turning the world upside down. And that was not a compliment, by the way, by those who said it. They were rocking the boat. Uh, the, uh, uh, the little apple carts of the Jews there, and the Romans, well, man, they were running them off of the track. It's like Moses. When you encounter the living Lord there on the sign, and he, he had to put a veil on his face when he come off of Sinai because it was so bright. He had witnessed the glory of God. And even then he could only see so much of God and live. But when he came off of that mountain, when he came off of Sinai, he had an encounter with God. And he will never be uh, the same. Wouldn't it be nice to go to our prayer meetings, to worship service today? You know what? We, we began this message about earthquakes and the power there. And God rocked the house where they met. Well, when, when Jesus died there in Matthew 27, 51, the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And when Jesus died on that cross, God said, Amen, with an earthquake because it was an event that would shape the world. And it was raised there in Matthew 28, 2. Uh, there it says there was a violent earthquake. The earthquake of redemption the earthquake of resurrection, and in verse 31, we find the earthquake of revival. When they prayed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and God said, Amen, with an earthquake. What to God that he would do it again to rock the church. Verse uh, 33 says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. And the Greek here uh, suggests that it was multiplied on that early church. Much grace. Multiplied grace and great grace. And there with great grace, God was showing unusual favor on that church. I believe God will show unusual favor on our church if we're willing to accept the challenge to pray as they pray. Prayer, pray for that to prayer that would rock the world. Well, may this be our prayer um, that we would have a supernatural encounter with God, a, an encounter that would completely rock our church, <coughs> rock our world, and that many would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus.